Good evening, everybody. Hope everybody's had a good day. Going to go ahead and get started. Beautiful day outside. Amen. You can go sit down. Are you done, Dave? <laughs> Dave's got to get the word out. Dave's our number one sharer on Facebook. Um, I need a pen. Write down prayer requests with. Okay, I really need a pen now. Just toss it. There you go. Oh. All right, now we're good. Icing. All right. Well, we're going to take prayer requests, then we'll get in the Word of God. Sound good? All right, so um, a few I want to mention right off the bat. Um, Darlene Robertson, who goes uh, to church here, just started coming back. Uh, she just found out that she's been diagnosed with breast cancer, and so we want to remember her and her prayers. Pray God's touch upon her. Also, see, uh, uh, Marcel's here tonight. Elsie's in the ICU, Elsie Black. And so her mama, we want to remember her in our prayers. Pray God's touch upon her. I want to pray for Stephanie's mother. She was diagnosed with breast cancer as well. And so we'll remember her name, Sandy Howe. Kevin's, Kevin's getting ready to have two knees put in. When is that happening, Kevin? May 12th. May 12th. That's just seven days away. A week away. <laughs> Amen. All right. What other prayer requests we got? Robin? I just saw that. I need to remember them in our prayers. Yeah. Shannon Wimberly. Les? Al Till. Okay. Bonnie Gilbert. Remember Natasha? She's in the hospital as well. Don? Remember Kathy Spencer? Vicky, right? Debbie. 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 Vicky Dick. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've heard worse. Battling breast cancer. Yep. Joneses are traveling. Like the Clampets. Like the Clampets. There you go. Ms. Page? My sister, Mary Jane Z, has a plethora of problems. Yep. Remember Mary Jane, yep. Brenda Mansfield's having surgery on her retina tomorrow. Okay. 
I seen one over here. Court Tuesday. National Day of Prayer is tomorrow, and the church will be open from 6.30 to 6 a, 6.30 a.m. to 6 p.m., and so we encourage you guys to come out and pray anytime you want to come out, bring your family, and it's always a good day in the Lord, and certainly a good time to pray, amen? All right. Carla? Jean Bill? Yeah. Oh, we? Okay. Seven to eight, going to hold the cross in the morning. Carbon and Maine. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get into the word tonight. Amen. Heavenly Father, we are thankful, God, for all that you have done. And Lord, you've heard these requests mentioned out loud tonight. And we just pray, dear God, Lord, that you would touch and you would anoint each and every one of them. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would touch the bodies of those who uh, need healing, for those who are battling cancer, to going to have surgery, to recovering from surgery. I just pray, dear God, Lord, you would be with each and every one of them. And we just pray, God, your holy touch be upon them. We thank you for being a God who heals. God, I pray for the needs that are listed there on that, on that piece of paper that we've called out tonight. You know those, the ones that are mental, spiritual, emotional, financial. And God, I just pray, Lord, that you be with each and every person who stands in need. God, we pray for our nation. We pray, dear Lord, that we would, um, God, there would be a great cry of repentance tomorrow throughout this country. And we pray, dear God, Lord, that Christians would find themselves praying. And I pray, God, you would hear our prayers. And may, Lord, we pray your will, not ours. God, I pray you be with us here tonight. I pray, God, you'd anoint this word. We are thankful for it. I pray, God, you anoint our time in this room tonight. And we just ask all this in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. 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 All right. I knew I'd brought a pen, see? Thank you, Miss Lisa. No, I don't need it now. All right, y'all ready? Armageddon. It's coming on back here, okay. I was thinking, man, it's blank back there. Armageddon. All right, so let's just do a quick review of the previous five weeks. So we started off with the seal judgments. Do you all remember those? Talked about the four horsemen. The white horse was the Antichrist. And the next one was the red horse, warfare. The next one was the black horse, um, death, no, famine, pale horse, um, death, and then we have the fifth seal, um, which is martyrdom, believers um, call for vengeance, um, and then we see earthquakes, sun blacked out, and then the seventh seal initiates what we know as the trumpet judgments, but we stopped there and we went to the middle of the tribulation. Remember we talked about the rapture taking place here, the beginning of the seven years, or maybe right here in the middle of the seven years, the seal judgments would be the first three and a half years. And then we would have um, the second judgments, the, the judgments of the one-third, if you will. And in the middle of the tribulation, we see some things that happen. The Antichrist is killed. Satan's cast down from heaven to earth. Resurrection of the Antichrist. The worship of the Antichrist. The mark of the beast takes place. The peace treaty with Israel is broken. Um, persecution of the Jews. And then the Antichrist will go into the temple and he will um, desecrate the temple. And I was going to tell you guys... I just got to get somebody to make copies of them, but I'm going to have copies of these timelines for you guys by next week. That uh, way you can take home with you. Um, I know you're like, yes, stop writing. Um, and then the trumpet judgments. And so if you all remember this, one third of vegetation is burned up. One third of the sea is turned to blood. One third of fresh water contaminated. One third of the sun, moon, and stars darkened. And I said that that's more than likely, it would, to me, would be like a meteor of some sorts. Um, and then... Those mighty locusts come to torment people. Evangelism 101. Amen? Tell them about the locusts that look, have human faces and have stings of scorpions. Um, and they will torment them but not kill them for five months. It says people will look for death and they won't be able to find it. Um, and then we have the sixth trumpet, an army of 200 million destroy one third of mankind. 
Um, and then the seventh trumpet is blown and we introduce the bold judgments. Um, last week we went over the bold judgments. Um, these were by far the worst judgments, um, specifically to those who are marked um, with the mark of the beast uh, that these will fall on. Terrible sores on all followers of the Antichrist. Turns not just one third of the sea to blood, but now all the sea to blood. Turns all the fresh water to blood. People are scorched by intense sunshine. Complete darkness over the kingdom of the Antichrist. The Euphrates River dries up. And then the greatest earthquake ever. Babylon's destroyed. Hellstones pummel the earth. 100 pound hellstones. Um, and pretty much we see the great destruction of the earth. And all this seventh seal happens almost simultaneously with what we're going to be studying tonight. The battle of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon happens simultaneously because in order for Armageddon to take place, who's got to come back? Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we, the second coming of Christ, um, this is a big deal. All right. So the first 21 judgments that we read, they don't compare it. Christ is going to finish it up tonight. Amen. And just a spoiler alert, he wins. All right. So here we go. The battle of Armageddon is the final showdown between good and evil on the earth. After the tribulation, Jesus will return to the earth as a mighty king with armies of heaven to destroy all those who have rejected him as savior. The forces of evil will rally the nations against him. There will be no bystanders. The entire earth will be involved. Jesus will defeat the Antichrist and his false prophet quickly. But the Bible describes the battle in great detail. First, we talk about the location. Where is the battle of Armageddon going to take place? Not here in southern Illinois. All right. So there's two main um, ideas of where the battle of Armageddon will take place. Um, one is Megiddo or the Jezreel Valley. And second is the Mount of Olives. I'm going to tell you why people think they'll take place in these two locations. And then I'll tell you my opinion and you can pick for yourself. Sound good? All right. So it says this in Revelation 16, 16. It says, and the demonic spirits gathered all the rulers of their earth, of their armies to a place with the Hebrew name Armageddon. Literally, the Hebrew, the Hebrew name means Megiddo, all right? But the problem is, there's no mountain named Megiddo. But there is a valley named Megiddo, all right? Now, does anybody know what this is? It's the plains of Megiddo. It's also known as the Valley of Jezreel, okay? Um, here's another viewpoint of it, Jezreel Valley. And this is standing on Mount Carmel, where, um, do you guys know what happened to Mount Carmel? What? The prophets of Baal were slain. So do you remember Elijah issued the challenge and they prayed to their God all day long and apparently their God was asleep or on vacation and he never did show up. And then Elijah, he soaks down the altar and he prays to God and God sets down the fire and then they're all killed. And you know, how long are you going to hobble between two opinions? And so you can stand and you see there's Mount Tabor, there's Mount Moriah, there's Mount Geboa. You also see, you can see Nazareth up there in the corner. Now what's interesting about this, do you see the green dot? That's where it's this. This is the plain that connects three continents. So here you have Africa, here you have Asia, and here you have Europe. All right. And so literally, it's kind of a uh, it's a crossroads of the world. Does that make sense? Um, and so the plain is so big. In Revelation 16, it says the armies of the earth would descend upon this place. There's enough room for the armies of the earth to descend on this place. It's big. All right. Um, it's this crossroads. Everything cuts through there. It connects everything, if you will. Now, the second one, the Mount of Olives, which I'll just spoil is my opinion. Um, that's the Mount of Olives. Anybody ever seen it in real life? It's pretty cool. Um, so you can stand on the Mount of Olives and you can look over and you see that golden little, that's called the Dome of the Rock. That's actually where we think the temple will be built. All right. You guys remember us talking about the temple that has to be real built? It's going to be built right where that gold, gold dome is standing. And so right below this gold dome is the western wall, all right? Now, if you look close enough, these are the gates. This is the city walls of Jerusalem. Do you see that? Here's what's interesting. This right here is the eastern gate. You guys see that eastern gate? A little shaky. See that eastern gate? All right. It's completely blocked up because the next person who enters there is who? 
Jesus Christ, all right? People that go in and out of the eastern gate, why? Because Jesus is coming back. Now, why do we think this? Now, the Mount of Olives lies just to the east of Jerusalem. Its location, historical significance, has led to skirmishes between the Israelis and the Palestinians over the year. You ever heard of the Israeli and the Palestinian conflict? If you haven't, you haven't paid attention to news ever, okay? So the site was controlled by Arab, by Arab ruled Jordan for 19 years prior to the Six-Day War in 1967. Anybody alive here in 1967? Y'all remember the Six-Day War? Okay, I, I wasn't alive. In 1967, the Mount of Olives returned to Israeli control, setting the stage of Christ's return and final battle in Israel. After the tribulation is complete, Jesus will return to earth from the same place that he ascended, the Mount of Olives which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it shall move toward the south. So I want you to turn your Bibles real quick to Zechariah. And Zechariah is not a book that we turn to awful, an awful lot, but it's right in the end of the Old Testament. So in Zechariah chapter 14... Say amen when you get there. This was just too long to put in the PowerPoint. It's like 30 slides as it is. So it says, watch for the day of the Lord is coming when your possessions will be plundered right in front of you. I will gather all the nations to fight against Jerusalem. The city will be taken, the houses looted, the women raped. Half the population will be taken into captivity. The rest will be left among the ruins of the city. Then the Lord will go out to fight against those nations as he has fought in times past. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of where? Olives, east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will split apart, making a wide valley running from east to west. Half the mountain will move toward the north and half toward the south. You will flee from this valley, for it will reach across Azel. And you will flee as you did from the earthquake in the days in the king of Uzziah of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all his holy ones with him. Sound familiar? On that day, sources of light will no longer shine. Yet there will be continuous day. Only the Lord knows how this can happen. There will be no normal day and no normal night. For at evening time, it will still be light. And on that day, life-giving waters will float from Jerusalem, half toward the Dead Sea and half toward the Mediterranean, flowing continuously in both summer and winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, there will be one Lord, and his name alone will be worshipped. Sounds like a day that's coming up. Amen? So, um, also, just to point this out, also, um, well, I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay. So, let's talk about the uh, characters, if you will. And the first one I want to point out is the main character, the victor. His name is Jesus. Amen? And he brings with him the armies of heaven. It says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on a white horse. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Jesus will not return alone. Verse 14, which I left out of there, says this. It says, And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses when Christ comes back. He will have all his saints with him, all believers in heaven who have been raptured or converted and killed during the tribulation will ride in with Jesus clothed in white. We will not need to fight. We will stand with our king and witness his power. Then we will rule with him on the earth for 1,000 years. And so let's break this down. Jesus is coming again. 
He comes not on a donkey, not in humility like he did the first time in Jerusalem, but this time he comes differently. He comes to bring war and judgment upon those who have rejected him. It says, his name is called Faithful and True. In righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head he wore many crowns. His name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the, 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 the word, uh, excuse me, his name is called the word of God. Armies in heaven clothed in fine linen and white followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth there was a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And look what it says that he'll do. He himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of almighty God. Um, this is going to be kind of a cheesy analogy, but how many of you here ever watch movies, right? Okay, y'all don't? Well, I do. Um, my son, Jack, he loves superhero movies, okay? And he loves like these Marvel guys, like Iron Man and Spider-Man and Hulk Man. And um... yeah. <laughs> anyway, you know, recently, this last few years, they had this climactic event called um, Infinity War. And then this end game, all right? And so it was the culmination of like the last 15 years of these Marvel movies and they all ended. And it gets down to the end and the superheroes are having the worst time defeating um, the enemy. And his name is Thanos. And he had snapped and destroyed the world and, and all this crazy stuff. And um, you, you were sitting there and, and you were rooting. You were rooting for the good guys. But... It, when you get to the end of Infinity War, I hadn't really paid attention to these movies that much. You know what I'm saying? And so I go with Stephanie. Stephanie kind of takes the guys, the, the boys, the men, you know, and I catch up when I can. And so I go with them and I sit in this Infinity War. And at the end of it, all the superheroes die. And like Jack and Caleb and Stephanie, they're like, <laughs> I mean, I kid you not, like the whole movie theater, y'all know what I'm talking about? The whole movie theater was like, in tears. And they're like, they're like, and I'm like, what just happened? Did something happen? Am I missing something? You know? And Jack's like, all the superheroes died. And I was like, no, they didn't. I was like, all they did was sell a whole bunch of tickets to another movie. That's all that just took place. And in the last one, they had this, this huge war and you're rooting, you're pulling for, for the superheroes. Listen, and you're hoping that they'll win. And all of a sudden, they're in their weakness, and, and they're all seeming like they'd be destroyed. In this fight, you ain't got a hope. It's not even going to be a contest. There's no competition. It's not like they're going to start taking blows at Jesus, and we're going to wonder if he gets up. He's God. You understand what I'm saying? He, he's creator. He's, listen, the Bible says there's a sword coming out of his mouth. His words will destroy them. You understand what I'm saying? And, you know, I always long for the superhero like that who just has no competition. You know what I'm saying? We have one. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. He has no competitor. He has nobody that can war against him. And so this, this battle that's taking place, Revelation describes it in this climactic event. But when it gets to the main show, it's kind of like... You know, like me against Jordan. Who's going to win? Jordan, right? There's no competition. But there he is. He stands King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Every human being will witness this final battle. This is important, okay? The Bible tells us in Matthew 24, 30, it says, Then he will appear, and then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And not some, not a few, but... All the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Revelation 1-7, and we'll come back to this before we end tonight. Behold, He is coming with cl on the clouds, and every eye will see Him, even they who pierced Him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of Him. Listen, I don't know how many people have lived forever... <laughs> But I think there'll be witnesses of this. I think there'll be witnesses of this. 
the next characters, the adversary, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and their followers. Revelation 19, 19 says, And I saw the beast, kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Which, I don't know how far you got to be or how to make war against him. But nonetheless, they do. I, from my stance, I'm like, wow. But anyway, of course, when it got to the locust, I'd been repenting, you know. Well, actually, I'd repented long before. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The Antichrist, the beast, will unite the world during the tribulation. All those who have taken his mark and worshipped him, and who are still alive, because there's a lot of destruction that's getting ready to take place there in those last seven, last seven bowl judgments, will join his armies to battle against the Lord. Evil will make its final stand against the Lord and all that is good. And finally, he's had enough. You know, the Bible says in Peter that he's not... Slack concerning his promise, but he's long suffering. You know, people ask the question all the time why does the Lord let things go on? Why, why does God allow himself to be mocked? Why does God allow our nation to stand when we've killed 60 million babies in 50 years? Why does God let marriage um, be created as dysfunctional and, and not be as it should? And why does he let, you know, Little babies get hurt or innocent get hurt. or why, why does he not just stop the problems with this world? Because it's his will to seek and save that which was lost. It's his will that none should perish. No, not one. He's not slack concerning his promise, but he's long-suffering, hoping that more people will come to know him as their personal Savior. Amen? Amen? And so, finally, they're going to take the stand. And then we get to the battle. <laughs> Here we go. We got... We're on the Mount of Olives. It's split open. The valley's there. You got the armies of the world surrounding this. And there's Christ has come back. You got the armies of heaven that are gathered. And man, everybody's there. And he's got fire in his eyes. He's on the white horse. He's in a robe that's dipped with blood. You got the beast, the false prophet, Satan, and the armies of the world. And they're doing war against this one man upon the horse. And the battle takes place. And here we go. This climactic event. God's going to finally end it. The Bible says this. As the battle begins, an angel comes out. <laughs> and he cries out for the birds in the air. Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. That you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and those who sit on them in the flesh of all the people, free and slave, both great and small. So there's Jesus on that white horse, the armies of heaven behind him. Though these are they, those who have been through the great tribulation, those who have been martyred, those souls that were underneath the altar. And there's this world coming to meet, and the angel comes out, and the very first words that are mentioned, there's about to be a feast, vultures. And all the birds of the air begin to circle this big valley. Have you ever seen vultures in Southern Illinois gather around something? So, when I shoot a deer and I can't find it, I go back the next day and you know what I look for? I look for vultures, right Ed? Because that's how you find where something's dead. You look for vultures. You see vultures circling, go over there because something's dead. Um, and so, listen, they're going to start flying around the sky. Now listen, I, don't just think like, Four or five vultures like you might normally see. Think thousands upon hundreds of thousands of vultures circling. Circling. Wow. It calls them, hey, you're about to have a great feast. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the world. This is Revelation 19 and 20. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the world and their armies gathered together to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his army. And the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast. Miracles that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive into a fiery lake of burning sulfur. Boom, you're done. Their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding the white horse. And the vultures all gorged themselves on the dead bodies. 
Amen? Amen. It's a big deal, right? They're not taunting men and women of God anymore. Never again will there be persecution. Never again will we have to deal with this. Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years into a pit. And we're going to talk about the millennium next week. But ultimately, we're done dealing with this guy. Amen. Forever. Amen. Um, the Antichrist and his false prophet will be captured. They're cast into the lake of fire. Now, Satan is going to join him in that lake of fire in about a chapter. All right? Two chapters. With a sword from his mouth, Jesus will kill everyone that remains. It will be the largest, bloodiest battle in history. The victory in his armies will remain unscathed. Not one person will be lost. But the birds will feast upon the bloody flesh. After the battle, Satan will be bound for a thousand years, according to Revelation chapter 20, verse 2, while Jesus reigns on earth. Amen? So, it leads us to what is the purpose of this final battle. And um, I'll spend the, the most time here tonight. Um, the purpose of the battle. Number one, first, Armageddon concludes Jesus' judgment upon Israel. The tribulation period represents a time of divine indignation against the people of Israel, the people who rejected their Messiah, and the people who repeatedly failed to heed the corrective and punitive judgment of God. It's no accident that the future period is often referred to as the time of whose trouble? Jacob's trouble. And so... We see the rising of 144,000 witnesses. Why? Because they want to give the Jew, God wants to give the Jews every opportunity to who? To receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. This is why in large people also seek out the rapture that the church is no longer here. That they're gone. That they're with Christ in heaven. And so I don't say that Armageddon is the judgment of God, but it concludes these judgments. Does that make sense? It finishes things up. It wraps it up nicely. Um, Secondly, Armageddon marks the final judgment upon the countries that have persecuted Israel. With all the hostile nations of the world gathered together in the battle of Armageddon in the valley of Jehoshaphat, God will deal with them finally and decisively. By the way, that's another reason why I think Mount of Olives is correct because when you look on a map, the valley of Jehoshaphat falls right beside the, um, the Mount of Olives. Um, Joel 3.2 says, I will also gather the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat and I will enter the, into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. And it's also one of the reasons why we should be fans of Israel. Amen? So, first it wraps up the judgment upon the Jewish people. Secondly, it persecutes the uh, countries that have stood against the Jews. Finally, Armageddon constitute a formal judgment on all the nations that have rejected him. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and that, it, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the almighty God. Um, Ultimately, in Revelation chapter 21, we're going to see something called the great white throne judgment. Um, is the great white throne judgment for us? No, it's not. Who's it for? For everybody else who rejected God. All right. And it's there that we will see Revelation 21, 8 says it has a whole list of liars, sexually immoral, those who rejected God. It even says those who are disobedient to their parents. Um, it has a whole list in Revelation 21.8. Ultimately, that they've rejected Jesus Christ, that they never accepted his salvation, that they'll be throwing into a lake that burneth with fire. Um, the final hell. And I know the question's coming, and we'll tackle it next week, because I know the question's in this room. If people die and they don't know Christ, where are they now? How many of you ever had that question? All right, we'll, we'll answer that next week. She says, I need to do some more stuff. <laughs> Amen? Um, I'm going to stop here for a second before I go to my last part. And does anybody have any questions that they want to ask 
about the seal judgments, the middle of the tribulation, the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments, or Armageddon? Yes. yes. Okay. What is your question, Miss Sharon? Scorpions. Thank you. Locust. Thank you. Those things will only sting you if you are not, if you are marked with the mark, correct? Correct. Okay, but when the word says that, um, that they still chose not to repent, how is it possible? And they're, I'm assuming they're talking about those people who have already taken the mark and are stung by scorpions. Well, so our question is, we think that there's 144,000 Jews that are um, sharing the gospel of Jesus, that are witnessing to win more Jews to the Lord, okay? Um, you know, just my belief by now, the church is gone at this point. Um, we're in heaven, and so um, essentially, you know, you're going to win the Jews or unbelievers, all right? So the choice will come, do you take the seal of God? Those who are marked with the seal of God on their foreheads, they believe in Christ. You would only get that if you believed in Christ. On the other hand, you would get the mark of the beast. And so our question is, if the Jews are still ministering and say somebody who has the mark of the beast repented, would the mark of the beast go away from them? Could they repent if they have the mark of the beast? Well, I'll point out a couple things. Um, I, num number one, I don't think that if you take the mark of the beast, I don't think you can go back. Does that make sense? Not only do I think that you can't go back, I think you won't. You know what I mean? I mean, they got scorpions stinging them, and they're still, they still won't repent. All right? In the next chapter, in the, in the bold judgment, they got sores all over their body, and they still don't repent. In fact, they get angrier at God. So there's that. Secondly, um, Specifically, if the church is out of here, okay, if the church of Jesus Christ is out of here, who, who is God's main mission field during this time of tribulation? The Jewish people. And throughout this, the Jews will be scattering. Um, where are they going, Bob? Basra. Um, so the Jews will be scattering. Across the world, they'll be scattering. Um, I think it's probably aimed directly at, at the Jews, the, the idea of repentance. Um, I think, especially when you get to this point in the tribulation, all right, we're well advanced in the time of tribulation. Um, so, you know, at this point, people are still witnessing. And to answer your question, my, my feeling is no, they can't. Um, but if there are still people who haven't taken the mark of the beast, then they would still be eligible to receive Christ. Yes. Well, if they weren't, then why would you have the witnesses there to begin with? Any other questions? You got one? No, so when you, and Frank's question was, he was talking about the killing of mankind, and let's just go back to, so, death to one quarter of the earth, and somebody did this math really easy the other day, who was it? One of y'all did this math for me, really good. Steph, you can help me. Um, but let's say right now there's seven million, let's just say, Let's just say 8 million for math, billion, 8 billion. So a quarter of the earth is dead. So that leaves us down to 6 billion now, all right? And so you move on. And army of, 
army of that destroys one third. Now we're down to 400 billion because it's going to kill 200 billion people. Four billion, excuse me, four billion people. All right. Um, and then you're going to have, it doesn't say the amount of death you're going to have here, but it's going to be a lot. If 100 pound hailstones hit the earth and people are, you know what I'm saying? There's going to be massive death right here. Um, and then Armageddon, everybody dies. So there's still going to be a lot of people. I mean, you think there's a lot of people on the earth. And, I mean, I don't know what the birth rate is in the world today, but you're going to still be having babies during this time, I would assume. Bob? Yes. Dustin? Uh, just something that it's not so much a question in terms of other than confirmation. But whenever the church is raptured out at whatever point, ultimately, children, children are going to be gone too. Yeah, it'll be a childrenless world. So how, much, how many children will be coming about in the future? I mean, we can't imagine what the upheaval of civilization would be for all the Christians. Yeah, you don't think about like a childless earth, you know, but you're exactly right. Um, I mean, if you take and just, just what Dustin brought up is, um, you know, if the church is raptured, when, when the church is raptured, you know, we have this idea of age of accountability. While it's not listed in scripture, it's implied that children go to heaven if they don't have the understanding yet to receive Jesus Christ as their personal savior. Uh, for instance, um, when David lost his child, uh, the Bible says, David said, I can't, I can't, my son can't come back to me, but I can go to my son. And so the point is, is that children at a certain age, and I think it's, I don't think it's a set age. I think it's different for every child. Um, but they come to the knowledge to know good enough that, hey, I have done something wrong. And either I've accepted Christ or I've rejected Christ. That's why I think it's important to teach our children at a young age that we need Jesus Christ as our personal savior. Um, another reason why I think it's good to be able to share the gospel to kids at a young age. And people say, well, were they young enough to get it? Well, I know Stephanie was four years old when she got saved, and it's pretty much stuck with her. Um, and I know others have as well. I was nine when I got saved. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's good stuff. But anyway, what Dustin's saying, even around the world, if they don't, if they don't have enough here, enough accountability here in their brain to actually... You know, God's a just God. Does that make sense? Then an entire, let's just say 12 and under, maybe, maybe older, maybe younger, depending on, they're gone. They're gone. And that's, is that what you're saying? I mean... A very good call. Yeah. And all their t- children are stolen away. They're not going to care why. Yeah. All they know is their kids are gone. Mm-hmm. And God does too. Yeah. yeah. John? You know, we have no idea the wickedness of the heart of man. And, um, you know, if, if we ever could understand the fullness of our depravity and what Christ has saved us from, and really truly how disgusting, you know, we are. And, um, you know, to think that he loved us enough and valued us enough to take on what we deserve shows it all. Well, I said this is kind of like a screaming. I mean, what, this?
Throughout Scripture, we see different spots where you can see the... I mean, if you look back to the ark, you know, hey, get on the boat, get on the boat, get on the boat. The ark was Christ. If you don't get on, if you don't go into Christ, then there's destruction and judgment waiting. Bob? I quit watching the news back in November, so I don't know. I said I quit watching the news back in November. My wife made me stop. I'm bad for my blood pressure. I think it's very important, this, and, I, and I say that jokingly, I do watch world events, but um, if you just take the last, let's just say, Four years. Um, I don't think anybody in this room would object to the idea that there's a, a wild um, kind of um, ideology that's ringing forth in, in, in the world. Um, and I think, you know, with the uprising of social media and the internet, there are so much people that have trouble wondering what's true and what's not true. And you could even understand, I mean, you know, you, we've seen very easily how. Somebody could spin a story one way and how another story could be spun another way. Um, and it's really, you know, maybe from perspective where you can put your shape of bias on it. Um, and it, I think it's maybe 10 years ago, we might have had trouble comprehending how the world could be deceived so easily. But now, knowing what we know, specifically in the last four years, and with the evolution of social media and how we have an instantaneous and a connected world, everybody's connected. And I don't know... I mean, it may be not be the same for older folks, but it's even cre creeping in. Um, you know, as younger folks, we don't leave home without our phones. We don't, you know, uh, I was thinking, you know, Caleb, um, the other morning, he, he rear ends a guy, all right, on the way to school. And, you know, I got to thinking, man, when I was a kid, I'd have to wait till I got home that day to tell my dad. I Caleb had to tell me now, you know, like, hey, come. And I think about how connected we are, you know what I mean? And, and um, with that, with that, with that form of connection, there comes, there's some great things that come with technology and connectivity. But there's also some really, really bad things. And um, we're starting to see those, those happen. And we're starting to see it more and more. It would be easily to be said that the world depends solely on technology at this moment. If the internet was to go down tomorrow, we would be in a world of hurt. Every one of us in this room, our supply chains would. Um, our communications obviously would. Um, anything in or out would be, our medical fields would be, that's how they share files. Um, and, and I mean, everything is, is through this idea of connection. So you can very easily see when you pay attention to world events, the culmination of years and years and years of walking away from the things of God and, and absorbing the new things. And we've made gods, we made a God out of, out of the internet. We've made a God out of connection. We've made a God out of our phones. We made a, a God out of, out of all sorts of things. And it eventually, obviously, it just pours into this end of times run. And, and I don't, you know, I'm not saying four years, five years, six years. I'm not putting a date on it because no man knows the time. But I think it's very hard to read God's word and know what we know and not think that the time is not short. Everything's there. Wally? So we'll talk about that next week. The whole next week we'll talk about the millennium and also the great white throne judgment. So we'll leave that till next week. Okay. Yeah. I just always thought how hard that must have been on John trying to figure out how to word this. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, John wrote down 
here, here's the thing too, and I, I should have put this up, but John wrote down, he, he didn't write down everything. In fact, there were things that they told him to put the pen down on, if you remember. And John wrote down what we needed to know. And there's nothing wrong with having mysteries that we don't know. And there's nothing uh, wrong with, hey, if I don't know what it is, one day God will explain it to me. And um, I hope and I pray that when you leave here after this study, you just have a better understanding, a better grip of revelation. My goal has not been to use big words. My goal has not been to confuse anybody. Just, hey, this is pretty much what we've been taught, what we know, what we look at. And it, 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 the, the plan seems to start coming together. Could we be wrong in certain instances? Sure. Do I think we're wrong of, of, of the magnitude of it? No. I, I think this is pretty, pretty easy to, if you, if, you, if you know and read the Word of God, it's pretty easy to comprehend less. It's a, it's a different world, different world. Trust me, people know where you're at, they know what you're doing, they know what you're saying. So, um, we'll take more questions next week, but I wanted to finish with this. And uh, it's funny, because uh, this isn't going to be non-Andy, I don't normally do this, okay? Um, but I just felt pressed by the Lord tonight just to, just to give Him some praise, amen? amen? And so, before we head out tonight, I just want to read you this, okay? So, Revelation 19, while it talks about the Battle of Armageddon, right before, in, in chapter 17 and chapters 18, we see the seventh seal happen. And there is great um, destruction upon Babylon, okay? That's the seventh seal. The city of the Antichrist. And the people of God start going nuts, all right? Not nuts in a bad way where they're like, you know, not Baptist, but, you know, glorified Baptist, you know, and... And here's what it says in chapter 19 of Revelation, verse 1. It says this, After I heard what sounded like a vast crowd in heaven shouting. Not a small crowd, but a vast crowd. Praise the Lord. Salvation, glory, and power belong to our God. His judgments are true. He has punished the great prostitute who had corrupted the earth with her immorality. He has avenged the murder of his servants. And again, the voices rang out. Praise the Lord and the, smoke that, and the smoke from the city that ascends forever. Then the 24 elders and the four living beings fell down and worshiped God who was sitting on the throne. And they cried out, Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise our God, all His servants, all who fear Him, from the least to the greatest. Then I heard again what sounded like the shout of a vast crowd or the roar of a mighty ocean, waves of the crash of a loud thunder. Praise the Lord. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice. Let us give honor to Him. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb. And His bride has prepared herself. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear. For the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. And my point is, verse 9 says, And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he added, these are true words that come from God. And then in verse 10, John says this, Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said, no, don't worship me. I'm just a servant of God. Just like you and your brothers and sister who testify about their faith in Jesus. Worship only God. And if we get anything out of the book of Revelation, what we need to get is chapter 1, verse 7, and it says this, Look, or behold, He is coming in the clouds. And every eye will see Him, all right? Every, and those who pierced Him, all the nations of the earth will mourn Him, all right? So, I want you to do me a favor tonight, okay? I want you to stand. Put your Bibles down. If you can't stand, try to stand. All I need you to stand for is four minutes. Can you do that? Amen? Amen? Are we good? Yes. And 
Don, are you ready? There's a song. The words will be up there. You'll know the song. And just sing along with it, all right? And remind yourself, this is what we need to be telling people. And Don, my mic off.
Good job, Robbie. <laughs> Amen. 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 And so remember, he's coming back again. Amen. Amen. And it's good to be prepared and it's good to tell others. So we're going to dismiss in prayer. I do want to remind you that we do have business meeting tonight. I know you're ready to go out fired up, but uh, if you want to stick around with that, you can. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you are coming back again. And God, we thank you, Lord, um, for our salvation that comes only from you. And God, we know we did nothing to earn it. It's all from you. And so, Lord, I pray, dear God, that we would use the knowledge that you've given us to share our faith with other people. God, that others might rejoice and, Lord, look forward to that day when we can see you coming on the clouds. And, Lord, we love you and praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we all said, Amen. Amen. God bless you all. You're dismissed.